Welcome to NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to David Spock to introduce our new medical director and speaker today. Great. Well, welcome this afternoon. We're going to have Brian Wood kick off his tenure here as the new director, and he's going to start us off with the new single-dose tablet uh, stride build. He's going to give us an update, and we'll get into some cases. Uh, thanks, David. So today we are going to talk about Strybuild, which is the new single tablet regimen we've been referring to for months as the quad pill. It is now officially named Strybuild. It was FDA approved on August the 27th, and it is a, the newest in a series of single tablet regimens that combines L-Vitegravir, Cobacistat, Tenofovir, and Emtricitabine. So it's a one-pill daily regimen it's slightly smaller in size than atripla, not as small in size as Complera. So think about those patients who have difficulty swallowing. Complera remains the smallest of the single tablet regimens. Strybild should be taken with food and two hours apart from any acids. That's because of the L-Vitegravir component. The absorption is affected by antacids, so that's important to remember. And acid use isn't a contraindication like with Complera, but it must be separated. So important for counseling patients. And the individual components, there are two novel components here, L-Vitegravir and Cobacistat. L-Vitegravir is the new once-daily integrase inhibitor. In Strybuild, it's 150 milligrams. And Cobacistat is the new CYP3A4 inhibitor, also 150 milligrams in Strybuild. Unlike Ritonavir, it has no HIV activity. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of the side effects and how they compare to ritonavir. And then the two NRTI components we're familiar with, emtricitabine and tenofovir. I'd like to talk about the two main studies that led up to its approval, the first being study 102, which was a phase three study that compared Stribild to atripla, or efavirenz, with tenofovir and emtricitabine. And this was a phase three study in treatment-naive adults, there were 700 total which were stratified to either Strybuild or Atripla, so about 350 in each arm, and they also got a matching placebo. Patients had to have normal renal function and a baseline HIV RNA above 5,000 copies. About a third had a baseline HIV RNA above 100,000. They couldn't have an AIDS condition in the previous 30 days. And the two arms were very equally matched. One main criticism of this was that there were not many women in either arm, only about 10% in either arm. Otherwise, they were very equally balanced. And I'm going to dive right into the results here. And what you see on the left is the percentage who achieved their main endpoint, which was an HIV RNA less than 50 copies at 48 weeks. And you can see in the green, is the Elvitegravir cobacistat or Strybuild arm, and in the blue is the Atripla or a Favrin's arm, and these were not statistically different, so this was non a non-inferiority endpoint. And when broken down by viral load strata, you can see these again are non-inferior or not significantly different. So unlike the single tablet regimen Complera, Strybuild really is non-inferior at all viral load endpoints. When looking at the main adverse events with Strybuild, um, so this is all treatment emergent adverse events that were greater than 10%. Looking first at the Alvitegravir cobacistat or Strybuild arm, first thing to note here is the most common side effects with Strybuild, which mostly are gastrointestinal, so diarrhea, nausea, also um, about 15% abnormal dreams, which I thought was interesting, and then headache, fatigue, but primarily gastrointestinal. And then the one that was most significantly different than atripla was nausea. The side effects that were more significantly associated with atripla were insomnia, dizziness, and rash, not surprisingly. Study 103 was the other phase three study in treatment naive patients, which was a very similar design, about 700 patients um, stratified to either Elvitegravir cobacistat or Truvada with boosted adizanivir. Again, very equally matched. Again, not very many women in these, in these arms. And again, you can see that Strybuild was non-inferior when compared to Truvada with boosted adizanivir, and this held true at 
all viral loads. And when we look at the treatment emergent adverse events here, again, with Elvitegravir covacystat, primarily GI side effects. So we really haven't improved here over our ritonavir-based regimen. And the only side effect that was more common in the adizanavir arm was ocular icterus, not surprisingly, and this did not lead to a significant number of treatment discontinuations. In all of these arms, treatment discontinuations were low. They're about 5% in all arms. Most of these were grade one adverse events. The other adverse event data that I thought was worth mentioning was the lipid data. In study 102, the study that compared Stribil to Atripla, total cholesterol, LDL, and HDL changes were all worse in the afavirenz or Atripla arm. So Stribil does seem to have benefit in compared to Atripla in terms of lipid data. In study 103, comparing Stribil to Truvada boosted azanavir, there really was not much difference. Triglyceride um, changes were slightly worse in the boosted adizanavir arm, but really was not much different. And then that brings me to the renal changes, which are worth talking about. So in study 102, there were, um, was a small percentage, 1.4% treatment discontinuations in the Stribild arm. And what was seen was an increase in the serum creatinine of about 0.1 to 0.2, with a median of 0.14 by week 48. This corresponded to an estimated GFR decrease of 14.3 in the l vitegravir cobacystat arm versus 3.0 in the Favrance arm, and this was statistically significant. But when broken down to those patients who had proven tenofovir toxicity, the serum creatinine increase was at least 0.4 in all of those patients. And so the notable things here are that when cobacystat is used, the increase is generally around 0.1 to 0.2. It happens rapidly and then stabilizes. And those patients who have proven tenofovir toxicity seem to have an increase of at least 0.4. Graphically, and I know this is a bit small, but this is the change from study 102. I know this still says quad, should say stry build, but you can see, here's the pointer, you can see a rapid increase of about 0.1, then over 48 weeks, it really stabilizes and doesn't rise much after that. And then this is the Favrin's arm down here, which didn't change very much. And why this happens is that cobacystat, like ropivirine and like dolutegravir, blocks the proximal tubule secretion of creatinine. So this will make estimated GFR, when estimated by the cockroft galt or other equations, this will make estimated creatinine clearance appear to change. Studies that have looked at actual creatinine clearance using, using Measures like iohexol have shown that actual creatinine clearance does not change. So this is an issue with several new or recent medications like cobacystat, ropivirine, and dolutegravir. So this is going to be an issue that will need close monitoring once we start uh, broadly using cobacystat-containing regimens. Briefly, I just want to mention the resistance data from study 102 and 103 because I think it's instructive. Looking at the columns here in green, this is from study 102, the thing worth noting here is that in both arms, about 5% of patients had virologic failure that was analyzed for resistance. About 2% actually had resistance. In the Elvitegravir cobacystat arm, uh, most of those had did develop integrase resistance. The most common mutation was the E92Q or NRTI resistance the most common being the M1A4V, and not surprisingly in the Favrin's arm, most patients developed a K103N. But it was a very different finding in study 103, where in the boosted PI arm, no patient who developed virologic failure developed resistance. So as we've mentioned here um, in these sessions before, boosted PIs have much more a much more robust barrier to resistance than a Favrin's or than Stribild. So this, although Stribild is new and has this new integrase inhibitor, this is not a regimen to consider in patients whom you are nervous about their adherence in any way. These do not have the robust, adherent, robust resistance barrier that boosted PIs do. 
So just summarizing the key points here, what we've shown in these two studies, Strybilt is non-inferior to the two first-line regimens, uh, Atripla and Truvada with boosted azanavir. It has fewer CNS and lipid side effects than in a fabrance containing regimen, but similar GI side effects to ritonavir boosted adizanavir. Because of the cobacistat component, a 0.1 to 0.2 milligram per deciliter increase in serum creatinine may be seen and may be expected, but an increase that's greater than this should trigger a workup for tenofovir toxicity. What What's in the package insert is to avoid initiating Strybuild if the creatinine clearance is already less than 70 and to stop the medication if the creatinine clearance drops to less than 50. So that's a key point to remember. The other key points, remember to counsel your patients to take it with food at least two hours apart from antacids and remember that it has a low resistance barrier. And I'll just finish by mentioning a couple other things on the horizon that you may start to see. l new drug approval application has also been submitted. Cobacistat, a new drug approval uh, application has also been submitted independent of the co-formulated Strybuild. Dolutegravir, which is the other new integrase inhibitor, which does have a much higher barrier to resistance, is in phase three, and we'll start hearing more about that. And then the drug company that develops Strybuild is also doing three separate switch studies, a PI switch to Strybuild, an NNRTI switch to Strybuild, and a Raltegravir switch to Strybuild, all of which I think will be very interesting and useful. They're also doing studies of Strybuild in patients with pre-existing renal insufficiency and a study of Strybuild in women so we can get better data in that category. And then the other new drug that I think we'll start seeing more data on is what's being called the 7340 quad, which is the quad, but instead of tenofovir, has a tenofovir pro drug in it, which hopefully will have less renal side effects. So these are things that I think we can look out for hopefully in the near future.